In this recording, we'll discuss the small intestines. Your small intestines, um, well, they're not short intestines. Um, they're six meters long, which is almost 20 feet. Uh, when we say small intestine, we're really referring to the diameter of the intestines themselves. Um, we'll see that in the large intestine, the diameter is a little bit larger compared to the small intestine. So don't be misled, y'all. Um, it might be a skinnier tube, but it's a very long tube. Uh, we also have quite a few things that happen in the small intestines. We've got secretion, digestion, absorption, and propulsion. So we get to talk about quite a few things with regards to the small intestine. The cells that make up the small intestine are collectively known as enterocytes, and they do all kinds of good stuff. Uh, they can produce digestive enzymes, they can produce hormones, they can produce mucus. Again, we've got a lot of things that are going to happen in the small intestine. The enzymes that we will be produced and secreted in the small intestine are going to be um, added in with the ones that are going to be released by the pancreas. And these two sets of secretions are responsible for most of the chemical digestion that we see occurring in the digestive tract. Okay, so not all, but the majority, the bulk of chemical digestion comes from these two sets of secretions. You make anywhere between one and two liters of intestinal juices per day, which is a lot of juice. Okay. This is produced in response to the intestines stretching as we move chyme through the digestive tract. The pH of this juice is approximately 7.4 to about 7.8. This is um, pretty much isotonic to blood plasma as well, so the pH is uh, similar uh, to blood plasma, not quite spot on, um, but isotonically um, similar to blood plasma as well. Most of the intestinal juices are composed of water with a little bit of mucus thrown in as well. We divide the small intestine into three different regions. Okay, We can see these um, regions are distinguishable from a histological perspective. First we have the duodenum. Okay, the duodenum is the uh, first and the shortest region. It's only about 10 inches long. This is um, basically starts at the pyloric sphincter and then we get about 10 inches before we move into the next region of the small intestine. Only the proximal portion of the duodenum is within the peritoneum itself. The rest of it uh, sits behind the peritoneal cavity. We refer to that as being retroperitoneal. That's a nice science word. We do find the major duodenal papilla within the duodenum itself. Um, we have secretions coming from the bladder and the pancreas that are going to enter into the duodenum in this location. And we have a nice hepatopancreatic sphincter that kind of opens and closes to let those secretions in. And last but not least, we also have a set of glands in the mucosal lining. We call these duodenal or Brunner's glands. These produce an alkaline mucus that helps protect the duodenum from the acidic chyme coming from the stomach. Next, we move into the jejunum. Uh, it sits within the peritoneal cavity completely. This is the next two, uh, two and a half meters or seven and a half feet of the small intestines. And this is the most active site for chemical digestion and absorption compared to um, the rest of the digestive tract. At the proximal end, we find um, villi and circular folds. These assist with absorption. And we'll talk about those again just in a little bit. So we've hit duodenum, which is the first, well, we said like, uh, yep, 10 inches, 10 inches, that's all we get with the duodenum. And then we get seven and a half feet of jejunum, and then the rest is going to be ileum. So here we go, we can see the villi, which are kind of finger-like, okay. and then collectively, Oh, here we are, little fingers. Do, 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 do. And then collectively, there we go. We've got the uh, circular uh, layer, the plica circularis. So if we go around, we can see the circles. All right, we said our last section is going to be the ileum. Okay. 
This is also within the peritoneal cavity completely. This measures at approximately 10.8 feet. Okay. This uh, runs from the jejunum all the way up to the cecum of the large intestine. We do have another valve here, the ileocecal valve or the ileocecal sphincterm. This is going to control movement of materials from the ileum into the cecum. Um, this valve being able to open and close also prevents um, things from moving backwards from the uh, large intestine into the ileum. We do this to try to prevent bacteria from the large intestine from um, kind of backflowing into the small intestine where it doesn't belong. At the distal end, um, we no longer see the circular folds. We're doing less absorption by the time we get to the end of the ileum, but we do find payers patches instead. These are responsible for helping um, kind of filter everything that's going by to prevent bacteria from the large intestine from taking up residence in the small intestine. Now, we mentioned these terms previously, circular folds and villi, okay? And then we also have microvilli, and that one's kind of new. We hadn't really mentioned that one yet. But um, the three of these collectively are modifications of the small intestine, okay? The function of these modifications is to increase your surface area. And when we say increase surface area, we're really not playing around. Um, you can increase your surface area anywhere between 400 and 600 times by just folding and circling and villicing and microvillicing. I know those aren't words, just go with me, okay? Um, the more surface area that we have, the more absorption that we can do. So this is beneficial to us, okay? And again, we can see the circles kind of going around and around. Each individual finger is a villus. And then if we take just one little part of the villus, and blow it up, we can see these little microvilli, these little itty bitty teeny tiny little fingers. Okay. okay, so the circular folds themselves, you can actually see these with your good old eyeball all by itself. These um, folds involve the mucosa and the submucosa of the small intestine, so we've got two out of the four layers here. These folds allow um, for chyme to be moved slower through the small intestine, which gives us more time to digest our food and then um, start to absorb as much as we can. So this helps us regulate motility in a way. Okay. The villi, or the little fingers themselves, are really just projections okay, of the mucosa. Each of these villi consists of enterocytes, which that should make sense. We said enterocytes are what compose the small intestine. Each of these are surrounding a central, uh, basically a capillary bed and a lacteal. Okay, so hopefully you rem we remember that lacteals from the lymphatic system are involved in uh, fat absorption, everything else will be um, absorbed through the capillary system instead. In between these mucosa, okay, so we see this little valley in between the fingers, these are intestinal crypts. Um, this is where we find um, the glands that we've previously mentioned. Um, and so like the mucus glands, the Brunner's glands, we're going to have a lot of goblet cells here as well. You can see all these little goblet cells in this picture to again help with um, producing the mucus and the alkaline secretions to make sure that we are not kind of burning a hole into the digestive tract. That would be bad. Last but not least, we have the microvilli. These are basically projections of the plasma membrane on each individual enterocyte and mucosal cell. So we went from a bunch of enterocytes in this arrangement creating one villus, and then if we take one cell, if we take one enterocyte and blow it up, we've got these little projections of the plasma membrane. That's what the microvilli are. Each individual enterocyte, so every little cell, each individual little cell can have up to 3,000 of these microvilli. 
which is kind of a crazy number. You know how small cells are. And to say one cell can have 3,000 of anything is kind of mind-blowing. But because we have so many of these, it kind of looks like the bristles on a brush. And so a lot of times you'll hear this referred to as the brush border. Okay, so that's what we mean by the brush border. The digestive enzymes that are produced and secreted by the enterocytes are responsible for catalyzing reactions to continue to break down uh, disaccharides and peptides. So if you remember um, starches, started breaking down in um, your mouth but then we said we we're going to stop when we hit the stomach and we'd have to pick that up later well here we are picking up later we're going to continue to break down those saccharides and also the peptides coming from the stomach from the proteins okay so remember we're going for breaking down those um, polypeptides we're trying to get them turned back into monomers now we have two different types of movement that we see occur within the small intestine. We have peristalsis and we have segmentation. Peristalsis is what we're probably most familiar with. We've probably at least heard that term a couple of times. These are alternating contractions of the two different layers of the muscularis externa. So if you remember back to the discussion of the four layers of the GI tract, we mentioned that your muscularis externa had both a longitudinal and a circular layer of smooth muscle. And so basically you contract your longitudinal and then you contract your circular and you just kind of go back and forth and it pushes food um, through the GI tract. Okay, So we're going to propel chyme towards the ileum so it can make its way ultimately into the large intestine. But we also do some segmentation. Uh, you might hear this termed intestinal churning. These contractions only occur in the circular layer of the smooth muscle, so we're not involving the longitudinal layer here. By only contracting the circular layer, this allows us to basically squeeze the food uh, kind of almost in like an up and down kind of way, like where it is in place. This lets the chyme move back and forth and around and around to mix with the bile, the pancreatic juices, the intestinal juices. Um, all of those are going to contain enzymes and the bile itself also assists with the breakdown of the chyme to allow us to do more efficient um, absorption of foods. Now your vagus nerve, we know that the vagus nerve is involved in the rest and digest portion, the parasympathetic nervous system, um, and so it hopefully will not come as a shock to you that the vagus nerve, um, we think it regulates both peristalsis and segmentation. And this is kind of what it looks like. So the one on the left is peristalsis. We are engaging both muscles, the longitudinal and the circular ones, and this allows us to basically push food down our food tube. Okay. However, segmentation, you're only activating this inner circular layer. And so you're basically just kind of keeping the food in place, but it's being mixed around and around and around where it is to mix with the bile and, and the digestive juices, things like that. So if you, only, if you only did segmentation, you wouldn't really be able to move the food through the tube. But if you only did peristalsis, you probably wouldn't have an opportunity to mix your food well enough with the digestive juices to really have efficient absorption of your nutrients. So we do need to do both of these. Um, we've got our review chart of hormones that are involved in motility of the digestive organs. So we've mentioned several of these. Uh, at this point, so we won't go through this chart one at a time, but just make sure you take a peek at this and remember kind of what everybody is doing during the digestive process.